Um, let's start with a question. Um, my question for you is, when's the last time you told somebody I love them? And I want you to raise your hand if you did that today. Did you tell somebody I love you today? I can't raise my hand. I don't think I did. How about yesterday? Anybody? Yesterday? All right. How about those of you who said it sometime this past week? Right, and I won't go any further than that. Um, now I'm going to ask you, what did you mean by that? Those three words, I love you, um, if I were to ask you the meaning of that, it would probably be as many people as there are in this room in terms of the answers that I've given. Um, fortunately, God has not left us without a definition what love is. And um, some of you already know we're going to be in 1 Corinthians 13 today. Um, I'm going to read, if, if you all wouldn't mind standing, I'm going to read the uh, passage. I don't know how many of you can see that. I'm going to read it through first myself. And I'm going to ask you to join me. Hopefully it's large enough for most of you to read. Um, if I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. So now faith, hope, and love abide, these three. But the greatest of these is love. Now back up, hopefully. And I'd like you to read that with me, if you would. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, I have not love, I am a noise of gong or a plain symbol. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but I have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all that I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. 
these words. I thank you for your, your giving to us in the scripture. I thank you for how you move, in this case, in the life of the Apostle Paul, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to write this passage. Lord, I thank you that it's been preserved for us for these 2,000 years. And now we can read it, we can see it in front of us, we can um, be guided by it. And Lord, we thank you for that. Lord, I pray that this morning, this passage of Scripture will come to life in this church. Lord, that your, your word would be strong. And that we would agree that this is the life we want to live. Father, I pray that you would be at work and um, make your presence known. In Jesus' name, amen. This is the type of passage that I probably could just stand up here and read it over and over again. There's enough there that it really doesn't need me to do much. In fact, I almost think I, I do it a disservice by saying anything more than just reading it. Um, the words are beautiful. Um, these are the words, as I mentioned, given to the Apostle Paul through the Holy Spirit. Um, for those of you who are interested in this kind of thing, the words were first put into English, these words, by William Tyndale. And um, he died for this. He died to put the scripture into English. Phenomenal. So let's look at this first verse. Um, we're going to try to break the, the passage down into bite-sized chunks. So hopefully you'll be able to, to chew on it some. Um, so the first <coughs> word is, if I speak, or the first verse is, if I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If you've read much of 1 Corinthians, you know that the Corinthians were fascinated with tongues. They were fascinated with the gift of tongues. In the, the church at Corinth, there were abuses related to tongues. There was a, a desire for tongues beyond all other gifts. And um, Paul states that even if you had this gift, and you could speak literally in any language in the world, or even in the language of angels, but if you fail to have love, that would be useless. It would be completely meaningless. Here's a, another translation of it. It doesn't matter how smooth your words are or how angelic your sound. If what you share is not rooted in love, it's just noise. I thought of an example of this. Um, some of you were here last Christmas when um, um, Nick Clark came with a group of his friends and played um, basically classical uh, Christmas music for us. He's done it several times in the past. And what kind of sound did he make with his friends? A beautiful sound. It was a wonderful sound. Um, however, Let's say that I got so excited about that, that I, I was going to get me and my friends together, friends who have the same level of musical talent that I have, and we decided we're going to do what Nick and his friends did. And we come up here, we borrow some of these instruments, and we serenade you with the same music. Your response would be, <laughs> When will it stop? When, when will it end? Um, we have, the point I want to make there is that no matter how impressive your gift is, if you don't combine it with love, it is noise. It is completely <coughs> noise. Um, we have several people in our church that have musical gifts. And they can use them in the church in a way that glorifies God. They could use them in the church in a way that is not. And they can make beautiful music or a noise. And it's not always the, the quality of the sound that really matters. In fact, in many cases it isn't. It's where their heart is. Is it combined with love? 
So the next slide, if I can get there. Um, 1 Corinthians 13, 2 says, And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. So the concept, the phrase, understanding all mysteries. I can know all there is about the future and understand the very mysteries of God and know all there is to know about theology, but without love, it is meaningless. Um, people who have knowledge without love come across as pompous. And it's very possible for us to do that. So if we study the Bible and we, we concentrate on the scripture and we excel others in our studies, we have to be careful to combine that with love or we come across like that as pompous people. Um, I think we also have several people in our church with the gift of teaching and of preaching. And those gifts, if combined with love, can be of great benefit to the church. So the next passage in 1 Corinthians 13 says, If I have a faith that can move mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. So you can have the faith capable of moving Mount St. Helens from Washington to Oregon. And without love, it would be useless. It would be meaningless. It would be of no benefit to anyone. And the last in this series, 1 Corinthians 13, 3 says, If I give all I possess to the poor, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Um, so I, I thought of an example of that. Imagine that um, you got so excited about supporting children through um, Compassion International or Children of Promise or one of the other agencies, and you support a whole village of kids. If you separate that from love, then what you've done has gained you nothing at all. Now granted, you may gain those kids something valuable, but it has gained you nothing. So in these first um, three verses, Paul has established a very kind of a simple point. And that point is that love is supreme. That everything else separated from love loses its meaning. So now he's going to go in in the next few verses to explain what love is. <clears throat> So this is God speaking through the Apostle Paul, defining for us what does it mean to love. <laughs> love is patient. Love is kind and is not jealous. Love does not brag. It is not arrogant. Love does not act unbecomingly. It does not seek its own. It is not provoked. It does not take into account the wrong suffered. Does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth. Bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. In these few verses, four short verses actually, short enough to fit on a PowerPoint slide, we have a definition of love, a working definition, one that we can use to basically help us understand love. Um, if we look at this verse, it breaks down into a series of positive statements and negative statements. He uses both. The positive statements are, um, positive descriptions of love are as being patient and kind, rejoicing in the truth, bearing, believing, hoping, enduring all things. And then the negative, what, what love is not, is love does not envy or boast. It's not arrogant or rude. It doesn't insist on its own way. It's not irritable or resentful. And it doesn't rejoice in wrongdoing. doing. 
What Paul is doing in this verse is taking love and breaking it down into its, its parts. He's not describing different types of love. He is describing love itself. And then he, like a prism, takes the, the color, takes light, and breaks it into its colors. That's what Paul is doing here in, this, in these verses. He's taking love and then describing it in a way that we can understand it. So how does he begin? He begins in a place where we probably would rather he not start. Um, he begins by saying, love is patient. We as a culture struggle with this. Love is patient. Um, if you looked up the word patient in a dictionary, would your picture be there? Would it be appropriate for someone to think of the word patient and you together in the same sentence? Um, as I was thinking about that, I was working on this um, sermon yesterday, and um, some of you probably follow the NCAA tournament, um, especially the men's basketball. Um, I enjoy it. Um, I didn't get to watch any games yesterday. I was preoccupied. Um, but I did catch that Notre Dame was within striking distance of Kentucky late into the game. I saw the scores. It was like a few minutes left in the fourth quarter. And I was updating my, my ESPN app, the GameCast, waiting for it to update. And wondering, when, it, when would this ever update? Because um, it was, I mean, if you saw the game, it was you know, tied a few seconds left in, in the game. They were up by two with seven seconds left. And I, you know, I was I was finding out exactly how patient I am waiting for that. <laughs> Working on my sermon, but you know, watching trying to find out what the score is gonna be. Um, so my concern is do we allow the instantaneousness of our culture to affect our love? Because according to Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, there is no such thing as an impatient love. That is a, it's quite a thought for us to consider. If our love is impatient, then it's not love. Um, the next phrase that Paul uses is to describe love as being kind. Um, what, what does it mean? Basically, this phrase means that love does kind things to others. And I, as I was um, preparing, I came across an example. Um, I don't know if you can see this very effectively, but this is amongst, um, there's some website that has the, the world's scariest trails. This is one of those. Um, there's like a series of boards that go around this cliff face. And you can see somebody somebody's shoe on that. Um, so the example that I heard given was, imagine that you're on this, this tiny trail. You're heading uphill and somebody's heading downhill. You come around a corner and you meet each other. And you try as best you can to get around each other without one of you falling off the trail. And you can't do it. Love would lay down on the trail and let the other person walk over. That was the only way that you could address that in that situation. And that's the concept of kindness here. The idea that you would do for others what you would want them to do for you. Um, you're probably familiar with that as the golden rule. Um, that is a description of love. Moving on. Paul says the next phrase, love does not envy or boast. Um, I want to ask 
you a question. What's your relationship like with your spouse or with your close friends or with your family members? Do you celebrate the success of your spouse or the success of your close friends or the success of your family members? Or are you competitive with them? Are you threatened by their success? And if you are successful, do you speak of your success in a way to encourage others or to show them up? There's, a, there's an interesting phrase, um, some of you have probably heard it before, um, the concept of a rising tide lifts all boats. Any of you heard that before? So the concept is that if you're a boat at a dock and the tide comes up, all boats go up. And the tide goes down, all boats go down. And the idea, the reason that this phrase is used is that when someone has success in your circle of influence, you can choose to rise with their success and allow their success to encourage you. Or you can see their success as a, as a competition to your own. Um, to apply this, I was thinking about the other um, members of the church who've been sharing the pulpit with me. Um, I'm not aware of any real competition. I haven't heard of anyone uh, even speaking those terms. Um, and I, I think it would be a little bit foreign for, the, for us to think of it that way. But it would be possible for me to be intimidated by the other speakers. Um, I could be intimidated by the storytelling that Steve Garvin does. Um, I remember his story from last week. I remember his story from the last time he preached the story, sermon. That could be intimidating to me. I could be intimidated by Chris's preaching the Sunday after Pastor Steve died. That was one of the hardest sermons I think I've ever seen given. And it was done with such grace. And the power of the Holy Spirit was on me. But I can choose to let that tide rise <clears throat> and let it encourage me. So I may not be able to do children's sermons like Pastor Mike can. But I can enjoy those. And I can be part of them. So, I'd like you to think about your own calling. What are you called to do? Many of you, um, quite a few of you, are called to be mothers, raising young children. Do you compete with other moms in the church? Does their success as a mother scare you or intimidate you? Or do you rise with their success? Do you celebrate with them when they're able to get their child potty trained, even though you're still working at it? Do you celebrate with them when their child is doing well in school and yours aren't doing so well? Do you celebrate with them when their child succeeds in college or gets a good job, even though yours has not yet accomplished that? Or maybe you never will. That's the kind of celebrating you should do. That's what love does. The love that we're talking about, the agape love. So the next phrase that Paul uses is to describe love is love is not arrogant or rude. So what does the word arrogant mean? Um, I think some of you use it, so you probably know the definition. Um, it means having or revealing an exaggerated sense of one's own importance or abilities. How many of you could honestly say that, that would describe you at different points in your life? I think my wife could, could raise her hand on my behalf. Um, I have struggled with arrogance at times. Um, maybe I struggle with it now and don't realize it. Um, it's not a pretty trait. And it is not the trait of love. So 
So my question to you is, um, <coughs> arrogance. It helps when the little people understand you're simply better than them. <laughs> um, this is humorous until you think it through, and you think about the members of this church. I dare you, look around you. I would bet that each of you, if you were honest, could see somebody here that you think is less significant than you are, is less important than you are, is less valuable than you are. It is really easy to get there and very difficult to get away from it. Um, the, the growth of our church in maturity will be dependent largely on this. Do we love each other? Meaning, are you as valuable as I am? Are you as valuable to God as I am? Are you as important to God as I am? Are you as important to this church as I am? The answer needs to be yes. But in many cases, it's not. I want to use a quote from um, a book called Animal Farm. Um, it's one of the books I read in high school. Probably quite a few of you did as well. I love this quote, one of my favorite ones. All animals are equal, but some animals are more equal than others. Um, we are, as a family of God, adopted children of God. We are equal, but some of us appear to be more equal than others, at least in the way that we treat each other. The next passage, um, Paul describes love as it does not insist on its own way. Some translations use the word self-seeking. So my question is, do people look forward to working with you? Do they want to partner with you on projects to accomplish something new? The answer is no, but they don't. Make sure you look in the mirror before you get angry, because the problem might be with you. <clears throat> Are you somebody for whom that phrase characterizes your life? So when you work with somebody, the understanding is, it's either going to be my way or it doesn't happen. And most of us won't say it that way, but we will live that way anyway. And, and I'm sure that either you have that issue, or you live with someone who has that issue, or you're very close to someone who has that issue. <coughs> Philippians 2, 4 says, let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. Um, I think Paul, in this passage in Philippians, reminds us that looking out for our own interests is not bad, but it is if it comes at the, at the cost of looking out for the interests of others. So there needs to be a balance in our lives. We absolutely need to meet our immediate needs. We need to be faithful in eating and sleeping and doing the things that we need, but we need to be faithful in making sure that others' needs are met as well. Um, I was thinking about that this morning, and um, I thought of, for some reason, my mind went to Beauty and the Beast, um, and to one particular character. Anybody remember the name of that guy? Yes. Oh. Oh. Uh, if, you, if you ever go to Disney World, you must go to the performance of Beauty and the Beast. It's one of my favorite things at Disney World. Um, and some of you may have seen the play. It's toured around. It, obviously, maybe you've seen it. Um, Garçon is convinced that he is the center of the universe. And he's convinced that Belle will have to love him. Look at me. How could you not love me? And as funny as it sounds, I think many of us are like that. We, we think the world revolves around us. And it's essential that we do that. 
in order for us to be happy. Let's move on. Paul says, love is not provoked. Or some, some translations say, it's not easily provoked. <coughs> so, how short is your fuse? If your fuse takes only a second to go off, then there's a, there's a lack in your life of love. Um, And, and you, can't, you can't claim that, well, it's my personality, or it's my background, it's the way I was raised. You, you remain responsible for how you respond to people. So the next phrase, this love does not take into account a wrong suffered. The concept here is that it does not hold a grudge. Um, if you look around the church and you see people, can you remember things that they did to you that slighted you, that offended you, that you still are struggling with? Do those things come to mind immediately when you see them? Then there's a lot of love in your life. Um, holding a grudge is letting someone live rent-free in your head. Um, there's a point at which holding a grudge is self-destructive. But this passage says that holding a grudge is more than that. It ruins your ability to love as you should. There we go. Um, I like this statement. We should forgive others as quickly as we want God to forgive us. So how long would you like God to remember your last, your last sin? The last time you trespassed against him? How long would you like him to remember that? Or maybe the other hundred or thousand times you've trespassed against God. How long would you like him to remember that? I think all of us would say, not at all. We want it to be forgotten. We want it to be forgiven. We have to do the same thing. Um, I thought this was interesting. This is, I believe, a sidewalk. And it looks like somebody wrote on the sidewalk <laughs> in tar or something like that, forgive. Um, and I'm hoping that they were aiming that at the poor maintenance worker who has to try to clean that off of the sidewalk. Because that maintenance worker is going to struggle with forgiveness as he does that. <laughs> All right, moving on. Love does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. How do you respond when someone is caught in sin? What do you do when you hear a juicy bit of gossip? How many of you have seen this painting by Norman Rockwell? Have you seen it before? This is the, um, it's one of his more famous paintings, and it's, it's kind of the, it's called The Gossip, I think is how he termed it. And if you look at the very top here, that lady right there, Notice that's her down here. And she begins a gossip trail that goes all the way through each of these. You notice that the same person is in the second one, and then it just keeps transferring on, transferring on, transferring on. And then finally, here, it gets to the person that was being gossiped about. Then that person, who I believe is Norman Rockwell, he did self portrait there. Confronts the person who began the gossip. Um, is it your goal to cover the sins of others, to aid in their recovery, or is it to expose them to public scorn? Gossip does that. Gossip exposes 
the sins of others to public scorn rather than hiding. Proverbs 17, 9 says, He who conceals a transgression seeks love, but he who repeats a matter separates intimate friends. 1 Peter 4 says, Above all, love each other deeply, because love covers over a multitude of sins. Finally, love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. And love never ends. When you hear that phrase, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things, I hope you don't jump too quickly to just the marriage relationship. I hope you think about all of your relationships as you think about that, that statement. As important as marriage is, we have, we have many other critical relationships. We have parent-child relationships, brother and sister relationships, close friends, our church family. These are all extremely important relationships. And this needs to characterize those. If you look at Matthew 18, it says, then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother when he sins against me? Up to seven times? Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but seventy-seven times. What do you bear in others that you are called to love? What do you believe, what do you hope, and what do you endure in others? How do you respond to disappointment, to disagreements and conflicts? Do you flee, do you suffer at night, or do you bear up under them? <coughs> do you believe that your friends who are far from the Lord, your family members who are far from the Lord, can be converted in a moment, like the Apostle, like Saul was converted and became the Apostle Paul? God is capable of doing that. And, and love sees in others that capability. I want to finish with this last slide. Sorry, either. This is the Apostle Paul talking to the church of Thessalonica. We love you so much that we delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well, because you had become so dear to us. This is love demonstrated in the heart of a mature Christian toward the body of Christ around him. This should be our goal in this church and in this community, to love like that. To what, not only to share the gospel, but also to share our own lives because those people have become dear to us. If the uh, worship team could 